I looked at Bitcoin as the way the way someone might look at an alien artifact. The very biggest banks talk about how important innovation is, but really, if they could push pause on technology, they would. The XRP ledger was created for payments and exchanging assets. Like that was the problem that we wanted it to solve. And we thought Bitcoin can't really solve that problem. My wife and I used to own a video game store. We wanted to sell used video games. My grandson, he uses VR for everything. There is a thriving website for gay, lesbian, and bisexual fans of Space 1999. If you look at the problem with like bad government, it's usually not bad rules. It's when you don't know what the rules are. The thing that annoys me the most about the lawsuit, and honestly, is that it is effectively acts like a gag. Like there's so much more I would like to say that I can't. David, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm super excited for this conversation. Um, I've known of Ripple, uh, and of course, known of it by reputation and of you for many years, uh, and I'm so excited to hear your story. Um, I'd love to maybe get started by an introduction of yourself, uh, your journey to crypto. Well, thank you, Eugene. It's great to be here. I've heard good things about you, too. I'm excited. Oh, gosh, there's so much to talk about. It's so hard to decide where to start. I discovered this space in probably early to mid-2011. I was basically looking for something to do. The project that I had worked on, that I'd been working on, had kind of, you know, I was working in the crypto space, but cryptography, not cryptocurrency. And I was very excited by the prospect of um of the sort of liberating power of technology. I watched the internet sort of liberate people from information gate gatekeepers. And I kind of have a bit of a libertarian bent. My family was very libertarian. Um, they kind of changed a little bit. Uh, I've maybe changed not so much, but um, definitely see the control of currency as one of the ways that repressive governments can repress people. You know, first of all, like exercising fundamental rights costs money. You know, if you want to protest, you have to be able to go to Washington, D.C. You have to be able to eat while you're in Washington, D.C. And so those kinds of things were important to me when I first discovered, well, Bitcoin. Bitcoin was the only, you know, maybe Litecoin was around too, but like Bitcoin was the only game in town. And, and it was very inspiring to me, both as a tool to sort of liberate people from sort of big, the, the control of the, the control of the currency, but also as another liberating force for people in general, like as, as, as the internet had liberated information, maybe this could uh, liberate people from control of money by repressive governments. So I started trying to understand Bitcoin and obviously that kind of led me on this journey. That's great. And, you know, I, I've heard, um, you know, I think you, you contributed to the Bitcoin project. That was kind of your first way of, uh, of I think, learning about uh, the protocol and just blockchains in general. I'd love to hear about that, that early uh, sort of journey. Uh, I think there was some kind of Bitcoin bounty and, and you, you sort of got mm -hmm. involved, but, uh, and, and I think you're, you're in some of the early commits of, uh, if you look at the Bitcoin repository, but I'd love to hear about that because that is such an interesting uh, way to get started. I don't think most people can, can, can say that. Bitcoin is challenging to understand technically because it's hard to understand one piece without understanding the entire system. Like it's hard to understand mining without understanding sort of the mechanics of the blockchain, but it's hard to understand the mechanics of the blockchain without understanding like how the transactions flow and how this something called the overlay network of how the nodes find each other. And everything together makes perfect sense, but every piece alone is very difficult to understand. So I needed some sort of way to get in. There weren't really well-organized tutorials or, you know, right now you can find a hundred a hundred websites that will try to explain the tech, the technical portion, I guess the hard part is finding a good one. But back then there was very little. So I grabbed the source code, you know, being someone who can program and being, you know, that's the way I like to understand things. I grabbed the source code, but it's it's a monstrosity. I mean, it's it's not not bad, but just enormous. And you have the same problem. There's all these different pieces that do all these different things. And it's even harder to understand any one piece. So I could have sort of browsed it randomly and hoped to find the good bits, but I picked a different path. There was a problem at the time. This was just as mining pools were starting to emerge. So in the early days, the, the Bitcoin software would mine on a PC. Like people weren't even using graphics cards to mine yet. This was the very, very early days. And the, and the thought was that everybody would mine. Just every Bitcoin user would also mine. Whatever tool you use to interact with the Bitcoin network would also you know mine and make you money. 
And that was just starting to change at this point in 2011. Mining pools were starting to emerge. And the Bitcoin software, there was only really the Bitcoin core, there was only one package at the time, was not designed for mining pools. So mining pools were using an interface that was designed for solo miners. And if you think about any technology, like building one car versus building a thousand cars, it's a completely different task. Like the tools and methods that you use are completely different. And so when these mining pools started to hit Bitcoin core software with hundreds and hundreds of requests for for what we call work, basically assignments for, for, for miners that were separate, it just started to melt down. And so people started offering bounties because these were people who weren't technically savvy. They were just sort of the very first Bitcoin businessmen trying to set up mining pools and maybe they could take a small percentage of the mining rewards in exchange for sort of operating the infrastructure, but the software wasn't up to the task. And so people started offering bounties. Someone offered 10 Bitcoins, another mining pool said, I'll add 20 Bitcoin. And I'm like, what are these things worth? And I think they were worth something like $15 at the time. So 15 times 20 is 300 bucks. You know, it's not going to make you rich, but it, it's better than doing it for free, right? So I figured, okay, I can learn about this software and I can also get some Bitcoin to play with the same the same way. And so I solved the, that problem. I imp significantly improved the efficiency of the software for handling mining pool requests and claimed all the bounties. And that later become my, became my down payment on my house when I moved to uh, Oakland. And it was kind of funny. That was the first time Wells Fargo, you know, when you they want to investigate where you got your down payment from. And so I actually submitted screenshots and URLs of all of the of where the bounty was placed and where I claimed it and the transaction ID showing that that that, that the Bitcoin had been mined since 2011 or 2000, I think late. Yeah, I think it was mid 2011. And it was a kind of a fun experiment because that was around the time where, where more people had heard of Bitcoin, but still, you know, very few people had actually worked with it. That's also kind of something interesting to watch. You know, anyone who's been in this business a long time, it was the same thing with the internet. I was an early adopter of the internet. I remember the first time I saw a web page in a commercial. I'm like, whoa, whoa, like normal people know about the internet now. And we all got to watch that same journey for cryptocurrency, which was kind of cool too. You know, Bitcoin uh, sounded like that was a, an interesting journey where you learned a lot. I'd love to hear about, um, I'd love to hear about how Ripple got started, how, you know, that sort of those early days. Uh, and I think you guys made a lot of waves. And I even heard about it. Uh, way back then, I mean, it was kind of like Coinbase and Ripple were the only two uh, companies, you, you, really serious companies you heard about in the crypto space. And at the time, I was actually a venture capitalist, now I'm an entrepreneur, so lucky to see both sides of the table. But I'd love to hear about the founding days of Ripple. Yeah, at that time, so that was probably mid to late 2011, sort of two cracks were emerging in the Bitcoin narrative, such as it was at the time. Obviously, the narrative was, you know, most of the people were technical enthusiasts. They were very interested in the technological end, and they weren't as savvy about, like, how to drive adoption. The only strategy that anyone could think of was a grassroots strategy. You know, and that's not how the internet got adopted, right? The internet was adopted by government and military first. So it's, it's, it's a possible adoption strategy, but it's not the only one. And the two big cracks that were emerging, so one of them was this idea that I mentioned that, like, everybody would mine it is economically incredibly naive. And it's weird that we didn't see it immediately. Someone's going to have the cheapest power. Someone's going to have the cheapest, mine, the best access to ASICs, you know, the, the hardware that actually allows Bitcoin mines to take place is very sophisticated hardware. And you can't go to Radio Shack. Is Radio Shack even still around? You can't go to Staples or your local office supply store and buy a Bitcoin miner. Like you have to contract with a manufacturer. You have to get time at semiconductor fabrication facilities. It's a multi-million dollar enterprise. And they're not necessarily going to sell them to you if they can mine at a profit. And so the first cracks were just starting to emerge at that time that this narrative that, oh, anybody who had extra power could turn it into cash or anybody whose computer wasn't busy could turn it into cash. That, that narrative was starting to crack. This idea that proof of work would be the great sort of democratizing force was just starting to, just starting to, to see some cracks. And I think the other thing was there were definitely what we would call today Bitcoin maxis. There were people who like Bitcoin is the best solution and it should take over everything and it should solve the payments problem. The problem, there's two problems with that. So one of them is, you know, there's the, the old joke, I think it starts from XKCD, the cartoon, like there's 13 standards, that's ridiculous, there should just be one. So you create a new, better standard, now there's 14 standards. So <laughs> it's kind of the same thing, like, and we definitely saw that play out over history, right? We tried to solve the pay, the sort of interoperability and payments, so it's like everybody will use Bitcoin. What happened is we've now created 1,500 new digital assets that don't interoperate. So we've created 1,500 new problems for interoperability. So, th so that was just on the this idea that everybody used Bitcoin is probably not going to happen. But even if it did, let's just say for the sake of argument, like you're a Bitcoin maximalist, you know, back then you're like, Bitcoin's going to take over the world. Well, you still have to get there from here. 
right? Like 99.999% of the world's value is in systems that are not Bitcoin and currencies and assets that are not Bitcoin. And so there has to be some means of interoperability, even if it's just to support the couple of trillion dollars in legacy fiat assets, you know, obviously that's a, you know, that's a joke. So, so that was sort of the, the very earliest concepts that motivated us. The proof of work was not the be all end all to Bitcoin. That what was important about Bitcoin was the fact that, that it uh, sort of is public. That like when you go to your bank's website and you ask them how much money you have, they tell you how much money you have. And if you don't agree with them, you like have to complain to the bank. Bitcoin doesn't work that way. The only way for Bitcoin to tell somebody that they have less Bitcoin today than they had yesterday is to present a signed transaction that shows the transfer. Like these are the properties of Bitcoin that we thought were interesting. It's it's kind of it's kind of interesting as an engineer in the early days. Like I looked at Bitcoin as the way the way someone might look at an alien artifact. Let's say I handed you some alien artifact that did something that you didn't think was possible to do. You know, maybe it just generates power out of nowhere, or maybe it turns dirty water into clean water, or it makes food grow faster. And you're like, wow, that's amazing. And, and if you're an engineer, you don't just use it for the purpose that it was given to you. you. You look at it and you take it apart and you're like, oh, I know what this is. This is a resistor and this is a wire and this is a, and then one of two things can happen. Either you find only parts you understand and you're like, wow, someone was really clever to combine these parts in a way that I didn't think of. And that's something interesting that you can use. Or you find a part you've never seen before. You're like, oh, what is this thing here? And it's not always obvious. Like if you took this thing apart and all you found was stuff you know, and there was one thing you'd never seen before, you might naturally think that the thing you didn't see, you've never seen before is responsible for the magic. But that's not necessarily the case. Like the piece we hadn't seen before in Bitcoin was proof of work. But the magic, I think, comes from the fact that there is no central operator. There is, all transactions are public. All the transaction rules are public. Anybody can enforce transaction rules. Like that was kind of where the magic was. And so we kind of took it apart. And the use case that we decided to target in the early days was payments. Payments are a multi-trillion dollar problem. And it seems like cryptocurrencies are just naturally suited to make payments better. And it's specifically, we kind of focused on cross-border international payments, not because domestic payments are great, but because it's it's their cross-border payments are the worst. Like if you anyone who's made an international payment probably has stories of, of bad experiences. And so the worse the thing you start with, the less amazing you have to be to be better. And I think like, I think we can eventually be amazing and sort of take over the payments world, but we're not going to be there day one. And so we, if we can't, you know, if we can't succeed against the worst part of the problem, why are we, why are we bothering? And so that was kind of the very earliest focus. And I think that kind of matured between 2011 and 2014, this kind of focus of like, we really need to solve payments. Like, pay, it, it, and if you think about any other use case, you think about an NFT, well, I want to buy it and I want to sell it. You know, think about a loan. Well, I want to pay the loan back. And I want to get paid like the amount of money I borrowed. Like all of these other use cases need great payments. And so we just sort of laser focused in on payments. And I think the other thing that we did different from the very earliest days was everybody else, including us in the beginning, had this ground up strategy. Like if you don't have a strategy, your strategy is get everybody to use the thing that I think is great. And I think a lot of companies are still pursuing that. But I think there's also a sort of top down strategy. And that's kind of what the internet did. Like the internet got governments to adopt it. They got universities, they got sort of big players. And so we decided what are the biggest players? They're banks. And we went after banks. We probably should have aimed a little bit lower than that. The problem with banks is obviously like banks are a big deal. Like any crypto partnership with a bank is a big deal. But the problem is banks um, are slow moving. And they're not, and especially, and the bigger they are, the less interested they are in innovation. The very biggest banks talk about how important innovation is, but really, if they could push pause on technology, they would. Why, why, right, right? You know, why would they not want to freeze time where they're now like right at the top? And so, aiming just a little bit lower, you have people, you have companies like non bank financial institutions, payment service providers. These are companies that have the resources to make a big difference, like scoring one of them using a cryptocurrency based system matters. You know, it's not like, you know, you don't have to get thousands and thousands of them, but also they're agile and fast moving. Like we had one partnership with a bank where there was a configuration problem on a computer that caused the system not to work. And they're like, okay, well, next quarter, we're going to figure out who's going to do the investigation. And hopefully in two <laughs> quarters, we'll have a report. And then, you know, oh, maybe man. we have a similar problem with a payment service provider. They find the person who made the mistake, they smack them and they fix it. And that afternoon they're go, they're like, hey, you idiot, you get it right next time. And then they're running it. You know, they're, five minutes later, they're running again because they it matters to their business. 
So the other thing is like Bank of America is a big deal for a press release, but they're never going to be a ripple success story. It doesn't matter what we do with them. Like they're never going to use our, they're never going to, it's never going to be the case where like our technology transforms their business, or at least not until it's done, not until it's so obvious, right? Maybe, maybe in some imagined future where we're wildly successful and take over the world, but like a smaller company can build a business around the advantages of a newer technology the way a large company can and they can bring those advantages to their customers. One of the problems with bigger companies is that if they bring advantages to their customers, then when they, they can't, you can't use Ripple for everything. Um, and so what's going to happen is sometimes customers will get a great experience and sometimes they'll get a not so great experience. And that's almost worse than always getting the same experience. You know what I mean? Like you, you, it kind of sucks when you don't get, when you, when you get really good customer service and then the next day you don't, you're kind of bummed. When if you got level the whole way through, you would be like, okay, that's not bad. And so it's very hard for bigger companies to sort of push the benefits through to their customers. So we've kind of adopted this strategy of targeting the financial you know, payment service providers. And then there's the sort of the other half of Ripple, which is the half that people are probably more, well, I guess I don't know which side people are more familiar with, but the Ripple is two businesses. So one of them is this enterprise payment system. And then the other side is um, things like NFTs and um focus on community and focus on providing tools for comp for smaller developers that want to produce sort of, I guess, half of us is pursuing top down and half of the company is pursuing bottom up, I guess would be a way mm. to describe it. Mm. And which are you more excited about? Just personally, I, I, I know what you think is more efficacious, but what do you think is what excites you more building it from the top down or building it from the bottom up? I'm more excited about the bottom up and, and yeah. it's, it's for a unique reason that has to do with the way that I, I sort of think and work. So the problem with the top down is that like the challenges are not the kind of challenges that I find interesting. They're mostly not technical challenges. They're mostly business relationship challenges. They're, they're sort of regulatory challenges. They're partnership buy-in challenges. And that's not where my expertise lies. And so I tend not to find those problems as, as interesting. The bottom up challenges there's a big challenge with vision. So, so one of the interesting challenges, like, so there's lots of technical challenges and crypt, like using crypto in new and interesting ways to make things possible that weren't zero knowledge proofs and stuff like that. Technical things that automated market makers do, I find fascinating. Um, so, th so there's kind of this kind of that whole aspect is th that I find very interesting. And then the other one is an interesting business challenge that normally I'm not like a business person, but one challenge that I do find interesting is you have to aim to where the market is. If it's going to take you a year to build the product, you can't build the product to where the market is now, and you don't know where the market is going to be. So I'll give you an example. So one example was NFTs. Uh, non-fungible tokens. So with non-fungible tokens, you've probably heard a lot of hype around them and a lot of other people who have like, you're selling a person a picture and they don't even own the picture. Like what the heck is going on here? Like, so kind of have to make a decision as a business. Like, are we going to embrace this new technology? Are we going to sit back and wait? And we could wait until somebody else proves that like there's billions and billions of dollars to be made here. But then you're going to be playing an almost impossible catch up or you could embrace it very, very early. But then you take the risk that, you know, like 3D movies, like, you know, there may be no there there. And so there's this interesting judgment of and, and, and in, in some cases, like you could say, well, I'll take the middle road. We'll make sort of a light commitment. But that's almost the worst of all possible worlds, because then you don't really deliver the people who who believe you and who try to work with the technologies that you're building get crappy experiences because you're not fully committed to building like best in class stuff. And so you kind of have to decide. And then and then you get into another thing that I find very, very interesting, which is like a, a resource optimization problem. You know, Ripple's a pretty big company, but we can't do everything really well. If everything's a priority, nothing's a priority. So then that becomes like, where, what are the things that we want to sort of invest in? And there's a lot more of that on the bottom up strategy side because it's a lot broader. Whereas top down, you're kind of, you're, there's only a limited set of customers you can target. There's only limited set of things that they that they have the appetite to do. So it's a little bit more constrained in the areas that I find interesting. So bottom up is more exciting for me, but don't interpret that as me meaning that it's more likely to be successful. I think you need, like, I think you do need both. I think if you look at any technology that became successful, like you look at the automobile, well, gas stations were a top down, were kind of a top down and refineries and roads, but also like people had to like cars and had to, there had to be cars that people wanted to drive and that solve real, you know, solve real problems for people. The internet, it took government and military to sort of build it. 
But then it took the bottom up adoption to create like internet service providers in every city was was because of bottom up demand. So I think you need both pieces. And I think it makes sense to sort of work on both. And I think there's synergies when the same company does both. Like, for example, a DeFi lending product is kind of a bottom up technology. Like that's going to come from a bottom up after like DeFi. No one's no the DeFi is being built like for for it being adopted by these early adopters. But imagine taking a DeFi loan product and then offering it through an enterprise payment system because you got to get the money out from the loans. You got to make the payments in. People who are not totally blockchain savvy are going to need conventional connections into the DeFi ecosystem, at least. In, you know, if you believe that, that blockchain is going to take over the world, then ultimately it doesn't matter. But even if so, right now, like you need on ramps and off ramps, and, and those are things that are best built top down. So I think, the, I think you do need both approaches. I think it's such a fascinating discussion and, and it really does span different industries. Um, you know, I, I think in, in VR in the early days of Oculus, you know, even before, uh, you know, the acquisition uh, by Facebook, we got the most kind of traction, um, you know, from the big, uh, we would get a lot of traction from these big, you know, media companies like names like Disney or whatever. But when you look at sustained engagement, you know, post, you know, pre and then post acquisition, um, you know, it's really the uh, the sort of the unknowns, right? Sort of that middle tier. It isn't like necessarily the mom and pops, or there are a few of those, but it's more like, you know, people who have the resources, but also need you more, right? Those are the ones right. that created things that had sustained engagement. And some of the best, biggest successes in virtual reality today, you know, are things that were made by, you know, like four person teams, things like Beat Saber and things like that, uh, which of course eventually got acquired by, by Meta uh, as well. Um, and, uh, you know, it reminds me a lot of, you know, I was lucky, uh, you know, in business school to study under Clay Christensen, the late Clay Christensen, and it reminds me a lot of the, the ideas around disruptive innovation and the kinds of innovation that, you know, where the existing players do adopt, uh, as well as the, uh, as well as the, those are the incremental innovations, whereas the disruptive ones, of course, are the ones where, you know, you see a lot of new entrants and new, new players. Well, Disney can drop a project. Right. If your project with Disney hits any hiccup, they can just drop it. They've got enough other stuff to do. Whereas if you if someone's building a business and there's someone high up in that company who is the owner of the project with you and they're all of their targets are built around your project, that kind of that kind of buy in is just it's just very important. It's just incredibly important. And then they will be a success case for your business, which Disney will never be a success case for you know anything else. You know, it's really fascinating to kind of hear that that early story. One of the things that really, I think, stands out to a lot of people even today, but certainly in the early days, you know, instead of proof of work, uh, or even later, of course, Ethereum popularized proof of stake, and now a lot of people are, are doing that, you know, unique node lists, right? I mean, obviously, it's worked with an XRP, it's worked over years, uh, but, it, but it is a very unique uh, kind of take on, on how to do blockchains. I, I, I'd be curious to get your perspective on that. How did that idea start? I mean, was it merely practical, you know, trying to increase transactions per second, you know, lower transaction fees, um, you know, and how do we think unique node lists will sort of evolve? Like if you look at the long run, do we think that's kind of the model everyone should emulate or, um, or you know, or will there be evolutions to that as well? Yeah, good, great. It's a great question. And obviously I think, I think a lot about this and it's a fairly controversial, it's a fairly controversial one. I mean, I can tell you sort of historically what happened with us is that in the early days, people thought that proof of work was the special sauce of Bitcoin. That was the thing that made it what it was. That was the thing that made it magical. And the idea of replacing it just with something else just would have seemed like, why would you take the thing that's great about it? And like, what would be left of Bitcoin? But it does turn out that really, if you think about it, the proof of work does only two things for Bitcoin. It does the initial distribution of the currency and it solves the double spend problem. But some, well, the initial distribution of the currency you might think is like important, but like how you solve the double spend problem almost doesn't matter as long as you solve it. So like, but, you know, honest participants just don't double spend. And so for honest participants, they just need to know that if dishonest participants do double spend, honest participants won't get screwed, right? Like if you buy something from me for a Bitcoin and you're malicious and you double spend it, I need to know at some point that I've definitely got that Bitcoin so I can give you the thing you bought from me. And if I somehow think I got that Bitcoin and later it turns out that it's a double spend and I don't get the Bitcoin, then I get, then I get, I lose money. So all I care about, I don't care how the double spend problem is solved. I just need it solved. And Bitcoin spends an enormous amount of money to solve the business, the, the double spend problem, millions of dollars a day. Um, and, 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 and that's going to continue even when the block reward drops, because effectively now the block reward is sort of a tax on existing Bitcoin. It's like, you know, it's, it's a, a bit of currency debasing. But even when that stops, what's going to happen is the transaction fee is going to have to pay to secure the blockchain. And so the transaction fees are going to have to be high enough to keep the blockchain secure. 
And that's great if you're the one who's getting paid the transaction fees. But if you're the user, if you're the person who wants to use the Bitcoin network, those transaction fees are a cost for you. You're paying the miners to secure the blockchain. Now, you need the blockchain to be secure, but it's a very cost inefficient means of security. One of, one of the analogies I use is imagine if you wanted to secure something worth $100,000 and the way mm -hmm. you secured it cost you $100,000. Like yeah. That doesn't seem... Really, like the way proof of work secures something is the honest participants have to actually spend more money than an attacker is willing to spend. If I have to spend more money to secure my TV than it was worth to steal, that, that doesn't, it, it, it's very economically inefficient. And it doesn't really drive decentralization for a variety of reasons. But one of them is just miners look a lot like other miners. They're people who have low cost of power. They're people who have access to ASICs. They're not a diverse group of people and they don't match the Bitcoin stakeholders. Proof of stake is less expensive security. It does improve on, on that. Um, in other words, if you have a proof of work system and a proof of stake system that provide comparable security, the proof of stake system can cost much less or, or someone will make more money, whether it's the trans, who it is, you know, whether it's the stakers or the people who are submitting, whether the transaction fees are low or high, less money will go to like electric companies and leave the ecosystem. But it, it, it if, if the sort of pitch that you like about Bitcoin is be your own bank, no middlemen, miners and stakers are middlemen if you're a transactor. And so the question that I like people to ask themselves is, who, whose problem is the system supposed to solve? And an analogy I sometimes use is eBay. Like, I think a rash, if I asked you whose problem does eBay solve, you, I hope you would say, well, people who want to buy things and people who want to sell things, and they have costs associated with finding each other and making payments work and the cost of like reputation, and eBay makes all that easier for them. And that's the answer that I like. The answer I don't like is eBay solves a problem for eBay stakeholders, where they want to reduce the friction between buyers and sellers a little bit, but not too much, so that the residual friction that they leave enriches them. Because every dollar that eBay stockholders make is a dollar that a buyer had to pay, but that a seller didn't get. And transaction fees are the same thing. Every like we people measure like the growth of the Ethereum ecosystem by the total transaction fees paid, but that's friction left in the system. That's bad, right? Like if the pitch is Ethereum reduces the friction associated in these smart contracts, transaction fees are friction that's still left. And proof of work and proof of stake are always going to have this residual friction. The system that we came up with for the XRP ledger is very radical because it doesn't have in-system on-chain incentives. The only in the idea is if everybody wants the double spend problem solved, they can solve it essentially by gossiping with each other in this formal way. And the only problem that you have, the only thing that can break that system is if you have a million jerks who just refuse to who just guess who just like alternate between yes and no, who refuse to cooperate. And you need some way to sort of reduce the number of uncooperative jerks. And that's what the unique node list does. It's a list of sort of people you're willing to listen to to resolve the double spend problem. It doesn't allow them to censor. It doesn't allow them to get rewards. It just allows you to gossip with them, cooperate with them to solve the double spend problem by putting transactions in order. I'm not at the point where I'm going to say that, like, I think there's a lot of people who will say, like, proof of work should die and proof of stake should die. I'm very... I'm very wary of trying to pick technological winners, um, but I, I, I do think it's kind of sad that, I mean, if you look at Bitcoin, transaction confirmations take 10 minutes. They cost, you know, $8 or so. The transaction throughput rate is maybe, well, it's around 10 or 12 transactions per second. It's, it's very poor, it's, it's, it's very poor resolution of the double spend problem. It's like by objective measures, it's very poor consensus. The reason it's so successful is because it was first and it grew. And that's not that's not irrelevant. Like I don't use the U.S. dollar because it's the technically most advanced fiat currency I could use, right? I use the U.S. dollar because everybody else does. It's what people in my area use. It's it's the biggest, and so I use it. And for something to win over the U.S. dollar purely on technological merit, it would have to like it's it's almost unthinkable, but it would have to be. You know, that's sort of what Bitcoin's trying to do, right? It's trying to win out over the dollar on its sort of technical merit. And so it's and, and between cryptocurrencies, there's it's it's an even more difficult to win out on technical merit. I think it's sort of an unfortunate historical accident that proof of work was was first. So the granddaddy of them all is going to be Bitcoin. Um, but you know, it's a, something like 130 terawatt hours per year. Uh, you know, 0.5 percent of the world's energy consumption. Uh, you know, the XRP ledger is is carbon neutral. It was built green by design. Um, 
I think there are enough, and there's there's never been any censor. You know, there's never been any censorship, and the transaction rules are still like all of the properties that are important. Like the transactions are, are public, the state is public, the transaction rules are objective. All of those things are independent of whether you use proof of work, proof of stake, or or some sort of Byzantine agreement like what what the XRP ledger uses. Um, how how were the participants uh, out of curiosity of the unique node list uh, kind of chosen, and how are they vetted? Um, one of the things I think about is like, is it kind of like the, the you know, constitutional, you know, in the founding days of, of America, you know, you had the founding fathers or now might, let's call them founding parents or whatever. It's kind of like this, you know, idealistic group of people. And, and it was amazing how they did create this obviously great system that's lasted for hundreds of years. Um, and so when I think of blockchain systems or overall, I think of how you establish good foundations because beginnings are, are everything. And in this case, you know, the unique node list matters, matters quite a lot. Well, the conceptual idea, the reality is a little different from the, the theory. Mm -hmm. The theory is sort of, it doesn't much matter as long as there's mostly agreement on it. So the problem would be if my UNL and your UNL had zero overlap, which would be okay as long as like we had indirect, or lots of indirect overlap, but the system works faster and more reliably if there's lots of overlap, because we, we're going to agree, the faster we come to agreement, the better. Um, and so in the early days, Ripple published a recommended UNL. And every, pretty much everybody used the recommended UNL. And then COIL started publishing a recommended UNL and the XRPL Foundation started publishing a recommended UNL. And I think what's happened today is essentially sort of de facto, the foundation's been calling the shots because everybody's pretty much been following them because they've, you know, they've decided to step up. To some extent, if there's nothing controversial, it doesn't really matter because there's no rewards to fight over. And they can't, they can't do a double spend. They can't censor transactions. So really, you just need something that works. And of course, the XRPL Foundation has technical standards. So they look at reliability. But there is one thing that's important. In theory, if there was, let's say there was something controversial that happened. You know, let's say somebody created um, a pro privacy transactions that, you know, use zero knowledge proofs to make payments. And they were completely anonymous. And some people thought, hey, that's great. The XRP ledger should have anonymous payments to compete. And other people were like, no. We want to pursue enterprise use cases, and this is going to make regulatory problems like it's going to be bad. And there was a real serious dispute. Um, what would happen at that point is that if if one if if the two sides could not agree, each side would have to stand up their own validators, and then sort of UNL the network would could fork, and so one group would have those payments, and the other group wouldn't. If you're an XRP holder, you almost don't care because you have XRP in both worlds, and if they're both successful, well, that's that's nice. You now have double the transaction throughput. So one of them has, you have access to the anonymous features. If you don't, it doesn't hurt you in terms of like you hold, in, in theory, you hold twice, you have like XRP and XRP cash or whatever they call it. Like as, as an XRP holder, it doesn't matter. But but as far as like the stability of the evolution, you don't want there to be forks. You want the, the validators on your UNL to care about the health and stability of the network and make good decisions so that you don't have to manually intervene and switch the UNLs. And so what you, so there's sort of two criteria. So one of them is sort of technical, very technical, like are they able to keep their validator working most of the time? Now we have some software changes that were made to the XRP ledger in the past two years that mitigate that. And so you don't have to be, you don't have to be super concerned about the technical part. It used to be that you had to be super concerned about the technical part. Like if a couple of validators failed, like there was a risk of a network halt. And so you really had to be concerned about that. We implemented some, some technical solutions that mitigate that. So now you can more weigh the second factor, which is very good. And the second factor is like, how do their interests in the network align with mine and do they care? For, like if that proposal happened and someone introduced anonymous transactions on the XRP ledger, you want validator operators that are going to look at that proposal and come up with a thoughtful recommendation because they're going to have to decide, are they going to join the UNL that has, you know, if there's a fork, they have to pick a side. And so it's really, um, it's a sort of governance function in that they prevent the users from having to intervene. It's almost like if you imagined a democracy where the leaders could easily, the leaders sort of had, had a lot of power, but they could easily be recalled. And so the leaders would have to do what the people wanted. But if you pick the leader who didn't do what you wanted, then you would have to, it would be annoying because then you would have to recall them and you'd have to find somebody else. Like you want somebody who'll be stable. But the theoretical idea is that honest participants will stay on the UNL. And if someone is dishonest or has some problem or whatever, they can mess with the network once and then they're gone. And really about the only thing they can do to the network, unless you imagine a massive conspiracy, is halt it is fail to resolve the double spend pump. They can't double, they can't do their own double spend. They can't, you know, they can't create XRP out of nowhere. There's no way to do that because that's just not how blockchains work. 
Well, thank you for that very thoughtful kind of discussion on, on UNL. Conceptually, a lot of conventional thinking nowadays, uh, you know, you hear a lot of people talk about, well, blockchains really have two major use cases. One is store of value and one is the application layer, right? And so, you know, a lot of people talk about Bitcoin as store of value and the application layer now, you know, obviously there's there's Ethereum and others. And with XLS20, it will be really interesting uh, to see how, how those things evolve. But before we get into XLS20 and, and NFTs and things like that, I'd love to think about, are those the two things, um, are, are those kind of the two primary use cases of blockchains? Uh, are, are we thinking about that right? Is the conventional thinking, you know, correct or is it is it flawed? Um, and, and in particular, because what I find interesting is XRP overall, I mean, you're, you talked about it. I mean, first off, there's 100 billion XRP, you can't create more. Um, you know, so in some ways you could think of it as store of value and in a certain way, and certainly it's used for payments, which you would think, well, you know, I mean, I don't use gold for payments, but, you know, at one point, at least the U.S. dollar was tied, uh, tied, to, tied to the gold standard. Uh, but then when you think of XLS20 and all the things that are going to happen with, X, um, you know, XRP, you also think, of course, well, there's really fascinating with the application layer. And I, I, I don't see a lot of L1s that have like both potential vectors, um, really, like Bitcoin definitely doesn't have application layer. I mean, you have lightning and other things. But, um, you know, we'll see how those things go. But at least as of today, it's really more, uh, at least the use case is purportedly store value. So I'd love to hear just conceptually what you think of those two and, and sort of, you know, Ripple's very unique kind of tackling of, in some ways, of both uh, in a very interesting way. So two kind of framing points before I answer your question. So one is sort of if you define applications as everything you can do with cryptocurrency but store of value, then, of course, then it sort of almost definitely breaks down into those two. And the other one is I think it's interesting to separate the functionality of blockchains from the functionality of cryptocurrency. So for example, you can use Bitcoin wrapped on Ethereum. And so Bitcoin can be the asset that you're moving around while the blockchain that you're using has application support. Now, whether you want to say that that's application support for Bitcoin you know, is a, is a terminology thing. But what's interesting is that like to some extent it's improving, but like in theory, there's no reason why your choice of what asset to use and your choice of what sort of application capabilities to get have to be the same. And I think that interoperability is going to be extremely useful because there may be cases where the digital asset that you want because of its liquidity, because of people's ability to hold it, whatever features it has may not be the same as sort of the, the platform features you want. And I think you've seen things like, like Binance Smart Chain is a good example of many other chains where there's lots of different assets on them and the chain doesn't compete with a native asset. It competes with its functionality for gas fees. And the people who run that chain are getting those gas fees and they don't really care. They don't necessarily have a dog in the fight as far as like what asset you're using. Um, they may care, they may not, they just want gas fees. And so they're just providing a service. And I think that allows a little bit of separation because like Bitcoin has fantastic liquidity. Bitcoin is very widely available. It may be the right asset for many applications, but you need NFTs, you need smart contracts. And so there's where things like, unfortunately, bridges have had lots of security problems. We need to fix, oh, yeah. we need to <laughs> fix that. But I think if we fix, if we fix that problem, I, we don't have to make, we don't, the choices are not as painful. And, and I'll say one other thing, and then I'll answer your question. So the other thing I'll say is that like, I'm not an, and I'm not, I'm in no way an XRP maximalist or even an XRP legend maximalist. What I want people to do is I want them to have the freedom to use whatever solves their problem best so that this ecosystem can grow. And then every one of these technologies can compete to provide the best solution to some use case. I don't want to build walls and trap people inside them. In fact, when I see other people doing that, that's when I think like you're, you're hurting everybody, including yourself, because like the users for the technology you're building don't exist yet. Like, it's like if you were building Twitter in 1990, nobody has internet access and nobody has smartphones. Like you don't have customers and other people are gonna create your customers. So now with like those three sort of framing issues, I guess to answer your question, so different blockchains were created for different purposes to solve different problems. Bitcoin was created to be a store of value. You can't really do anything without that. And it was kind of created to be good at payments. It just has proved, you know, it's, it's store of value use has eclipsed its payment use, like a digital form of gold. From an asset standpoint, I think there are advantages to sort of broad adoption of the same asset. Like imagine if I had one type of money that I got paid by my employer, one type of money I used to buy groceries, one type of money that I saved up, one type of money that I used to buy food, you know, that one to pay rent, like that would be very annoying. And so I think we need this sort of interoperability and bridges. Ethereum was built for smart contracts, like the, the world's computer for money was like the initial pitch. The XRP ledger was created for payments and exchanging assets. Like that was the problem that we wanted it to solve. And we thought Bitcoin can't really solve that problem uh, for one thing, because it has no, no, no decentralized exchange. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't expand on the application side. 
I do think that the world, the idea that one asset is going to sort of take over, I don't think is likely, but it's at least it's at least not technically obviously wrong. The idea of one blockchain taking over is sort of technically obviously wrong because you can't put everything on one blockchain. They just no matter how well they scale, you want that scaling for payments. You want that scaling for NFTs. Like there are people who are like, I'm going to release as many NFTs as the technology will let me release. And, uh, you know, and, and you can use cost to sort of drive down the number that they can adopt, but then they may pursue cheaper systems. And then again, you won't have one system that wins out, right? The cheaper one will be used for the people who want to put out thousands of NFTs and maybe Ethereum, which can't put, you know, hundreds of thousands of NFTs on them. The cost, they have to be high value, but maybe the premium NFTs will wind up on Ethereum. So you're going to get this diverse ecosystem. And so interoperability is going to be ex extremely important. I mean, if you look, Bitcoin, you, you know, you look at the confirmation time, you look at the cost, it's good as a store of value where those things don't matter. Ethereum has, you know, as Turing complete smart contracts are close to Turing complete, but cost, speed, you know, look at the XRP ledger, you have transactions in a couple of seconds, you know, a fraction of a penny, 1500 transactions per second. You have some nice functions, like you have the decentralized exchange, uh, you'll have NFTs if XLS 20s approved, like you'll have, but, but you can't, you know, you can't invent, you can't write your own, you know, applications directly into the blockchain. So I think I think the all of these things are going to compete and I don't have a crystal ball to sort of predict the direction of the future. But I, I will say what I've said again, which is like what I said before and what I keep saying is like payments seem to be to me, and I think everybody in the cryptocurrency space, like I asked them like whatever cryptocurrency they have, like or if, you know, if it's Bitcoin where it's obviously not going to be used for payments, I, I point to some other cryptocurrency like Dash. I'm like, why has haven't these been adopted for payments? They're cheap. They're fast. They work. There's adequate liquidity. It seems like the elephant in the room, like we should be able to crack payments. And I still spend a lot of time thinking, what do we still need to do? You know, this is if you build it, they will come. I think we built it. Where the heck is everybody? And we're trying to figure out, we're trying to improve liquidity because like being able to move between assets is important. We're trying to improve interoperability between blockchains. Still though, I think the ultimate goal is like, we should solve payments because payments hurt people. I mean, they're, they're, if, if you, anyone who has made remittances, anybody who's tried, to, I mean, we should be able to fix that. And so I still, I always just keep coming back to it. It's the thing that keeps annoying me that we haven't solved yet. Yeah. Keep it simple is, is, is often a, a Occam's razor. You're solving problems people know they have. Like for some of these other things, you sort of have to convince people that they have a problem that you're solving. You know what I mean? Like NFTs, I'm not, not against NFTs, but like you have to explain to people what people are like, oh yes, I have these 10 problems that NFTs solve. Like some people do, but very few. Whereas payments, anybody who's ever made an international payment is like, please fix that. Please, you know, that, that's terrible. And it seems like it's a perfect fit. Technology fits them. And yet we still haven't quite got it. And that's kind of frustrating to me. Yeah, I, I guess what problem does a JPEG of a mutant ape solve? I mean, I guess other than the the, the, the Veblen good thing of, uh, of you know, uh, rich people showing off how rich they are, which I guess is a problem. So, you know, in the digital world, it's certainly I shouldn't say that's not a problem, but, you know, it, it, it's it's not a core use case that I think, you know, billions of people around the world have. Well, you know, you know, I push back a tiny bit on that. So obviously I agree with you on JPEGs of apes, like not everybody needs JPEGs of apes, but I think there are core problems people have that NFTs could solve. And I'll give you like my, my pitch for that, which is you probably have digital rights of all kinds all over the place. There's probably songs that you've purchased on some platform. You might have books on Kindle. You might have movies on Hulu. You might have like satellite TV. And this is a marketplace that's built for the market. It's not built for you because your rights are all over. like, if you want to dump Hulu, because you don't want to pay $70 a month, you lose all the movies you bought on Hulu. That's great for Hulu and terrible for you. If you get a new TV that doesn't work well with Hulu, but works well with Amazon Prime, well, sorry, you're gonna, you know, that's great for Amazon. Um, but you know, and, but it's, it's not built for you. These marketplaces were built for the marketplace. And they're not built for the rights holders either. If you ask any of the rights holders, like, for example, if you let's say you, you're the rights holder on a new movie, You've got one shot, maybe a month when people will pay 22 bucks for the movie. But if I'm thinking I may not have Hulu in four months when I want to watch the movie a second time, I'm just going to rent it. You've lost your opportunity. So like NFTs could be this, the, 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 the wallet, the, the wallet of digital rights. And that's an expanding of games, you know, games that you own. Like I have games on steam. I have games on, on, um, uh, other, other services, like all these different services. They're spread out all over the place and it's a mess for me. And like, some sort of an interoperable standard to solve that problem 
solves a real, I mean, it is a real problem that people have. The question is, can NFT solve it? You know, it's the same thing. Payments are a real problem people have. The question is, can cryptocurrency solve it? And technically it looks like they can, but that doesn't, you know, there's all these non-technical challenges that we keep coming back to. Being in the profession of creating movies, you know, creating virtual reality movies, I, I actually think a lot about this specific problem because, um, and also like what asset will, will sort of lead the way for that. So, so, you know, you can imagine a future like far into the future where, you know, and this would have to be a system where the real world integrates seamlessly with the digital world. So for example, you know, putting, you know, real estate on the blockchain, which I know you, you all are working off Columbia, which is fascinating. I want to get into that, but talking about media rights, um, you know, let's say, let's go all the way back. Okay. You're Shakespeare and you know, you, you have a saying, you've created this play Hamlet 1600s. And if, if Shakespeare had access to something like the, you know, something like NFTs, uh, where he could get rights based on the future sales or he has in, he and his heirs, maybe it eventually goes in public domain. Um, and, and, you know, he sort of gets that. I mean, wouldn't that be a more, well, certainly an interesting way. I don't know if it's a better way, but it's certainly an interesting way for digital rights. And I choose Shakespeare just because it's a very basic thing. It's like movies and music and they're all very, but I just mean like a written word. It's such a simple thing. Like how would, how would a writer put a book on the blockchain, for example, instead of going to the publishing houses and uh, how does that look like from, you know, from an ongoing monetization for that individual, for the artist, but also for the consumer, right? It's like, okay, well, this is better for the end consumer. It's better for the artist. Not so great for the people in the middle uh, who are a lot of power, power brokers. Um, and, and I think a lot about, well, what assets work best? What would be the best use case, the leading use case? And, um, you know, how does the system look? Like, I'm, I'm super extremely interested in this whole digital rights uh, thing and, and a world where that actually can be possible where I think it'll create a world where artists get paid more and consumers get paid less, uh, get pay less. So, which I think is, an, is a more ideal world than what exists today. Yeah. And that was kind of the promise of services like YouTube yeah. and, and any number of other services where you could put, you could like upload content somewhere and you could put um, ads on it or monetize it or charge for access to it. And I think one of the, it, it's interesting to see the ways in which they've succeeded and the ways in which they haven't succeeded. But I think the most interesting thing is that you have a very small number of very successful artists and a very long tail of people who are basically making nothing at all. And I, I that doesn't seem like that should inherently be right. I mean, from an objective standpoint, this isn't like professional basketball, like the differences between the very best authors and like one tier down are nearly negligible. And, 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 and yet the revenue differences are sort of enormous. And there's a, there's a popularity thing where people want to listen to the songs that their friends are listening to. They want to play the games their friends are, are playing. They want to read the books their friends are reading. Um, if that's a local phenomenon, that, that that then it doesn't scale. But if that's a global phenomenon, that's not so bad because you don't have to have a very big following to have a big enough following that that you can have the perception that you're reading the book that other people are reading, even if those people are scattered over the over the planet. So I think the the, the, the social aspect is is absolutely critical. My wife and I used to own a video game store. We want to sell used video games, and they're so much cheaper than new ones way back when. And one of the problems we discovered is that people, it didn't matter how good an old video game was, people wanted to play the ones that they saw being advertised. They wanted, when the new Halo came out, they wanted it. And it was very, very hard, even at greatly reduced prices. And objectively, there's not that much difference between the games. Like, you know, four years from now, when you compare this, those two games, the one that was $70 and the one that was $32, there's not going to, you know, the, the $32 one may have even had better reviews. But everybody wanted to play the new Halo game. And I think... We, we kind of need, we need to get, if we get the community aspect right, and so people can find the content that they like, the internet did a little bit of that. You know, I don't know if you remember, there was a TV show called Space 1999 way back when. There was a thriving website for gay, lesbian, and bisexual fans of Space 1999. Like, you know, if you if you fit that demographic, you might easily think you're the only one. Right. You know, it, but there's a there's there's a fan base for that. And they found each other because they all like that that's what they're interested in and so that can drive that can drive out the sort of folk the insta the sort of market forces to drive us all into the same piles but i think also like we need fantastic technical solutions those people are not also going to be blockchain enthusiasts right if it was yeah. the set of gay <laughs> lesbian and bisexual fans of space 1999 who was who were blockchain enthusiasts like they couldn't yeah. exist so the user experience is critical and if you look at like the nft projects and the the blockchain projects that have like turned that corner they don't need the user to be a blockchain enthusiast or very you know 
the first cars, you had to be a mechanic to have a car. Computers, you had to, you know, if you wanted to be on the internet, you it was all text-based. Like we, we, we have to make the user experiences amazing. And I think we do still have an interesting problem of like, where is that book stored? Is the book stored on the blockchain or is it stored somewhere else in the blockchain sort of unlocks the book? And if the book chain unlocks the book, who's the custodian of the lock? And I think solving that kind of problem, um, I was looking at doing something like that for rights to videos. And the problem is like that market is so consolidated and there's 800 pound gorillas everywhere you look and they're very jealous of their sort of powers as a middleman. So I think figuring out the right way to do that is going to be an interesting business challenge. I think if I wasn't working at Ripple, if I didn't have this profound feeling that like my work at Ripple wasn't done yet, I think probably I could very that could very well be the problem that that you know if I couldn't find something else in payments, I think that's the problem that I find most interesting because I think there are technical problems in there. So there's a technical problem of like who holds the data and 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 how does the key only go? It's almost like a digital right. We, we don't want what's traditionally been called digital rights management. We want something like that. We want somebody incentivized to store the data, but not necessarily able to control who gets it. And so there are interesting technical problems and standards development problems in there about how to build that. But I think that's that's definitely a direction NFTs could go. Collectibles are interesting. Um, but I think they're largely, you know, I, I don't think they're they're I think solving like real world problems around digital rights and, and monetization of digital rights is, is very interesting. So there's a company that we partnered with. My predecessor as CTO of Ripple, Stefan Thomas, left to start Coil. And the problem that Coil is focused on is monetization of, um, of streams or websites. And he developed, he developed a product. Um, it's an open standard and you, you don't have to be a Coil customer to be on either side of this where people can browse websites and the website can send a tag that says, hey, if you want to pay me, here's how to do it. And then your browser can sort of stream money at the website and it can unlock content and it's completely transparent. And and I think like that, that's that's an example of like liberating you know, today. If you want to monetize a website, like people have to pay you in ways that are very awkward and have people have lots of like, if you're not worth a subscription, you're going to make zero. You know, and, and if you're worth a subscription, you're going to have frustrated customers who like can't don't remember to shut it off and you're just going to really annoy your users. And so I think like that's that's an example of where like we have these abilities to make very small payments, which I think is what you might need for, you know, I might not want to buy the whole book even, you know, like those kinds of, or, or I might want to watch a video and then I'm like, ah, you know what, I don't like this video. Um, but there are, there are a lot of technical challenges and it's going to be interesting to see whether the industry can solve those technical challenges and then drive adoption. It, it, it's, it's, not, it's not simple, but I think, that's, I think it's interesting that people in the space are working on those problems. And I think they, they do have a real, prob a real problem. They do have some product market fit, but they just need to come up with the right solutions. The user experience. From the user's point of view, the experience is the product. Yeah. You know, the thing I think about is uh, and the reason I chose the written word is it's, you know, it's small from a file size perspective, but still like, where do you store it, right? Because, I mean, you could use IPFS. I mean, Board Yacht Club, those JPEGs are still are on IPFS, which is probably a better way than a pointer to something on your AWS server, which a lot of quote NFTs yeah. are. Um, so, so text, but then trying to store what we try to do is store, you know, like book text in the Ethereum blockchain, like specifically, um, you know, in the blockchain. And that, of course, you know, Ethereum is not great for, you know, large groups of text. It just creates, you know, your, your fee, your gas fees just go through the roof. So that's not a great solution either. Um, so there are definitely technical challenges. And then, of course, more so behavioral business, how do you consumer challenges uh, that will go with that. So I'm really excited to see kind of what's uh, what's going to lead the way, um, which I think brings us to XLS20. So, you know, we've been we've been hinting and talking about it, but uh, um, we'd love to hear about XLS20. Such an exciting uh, you know development. Uh, been great to see the announcements as well as the follow on activity um, you know, across all the different channels. Um, would love to hear about, you know, the overview, the differences between, you know, you know, ETH, Solana, AVAX, et cetera, and just like kind of what your hopes for uh, what XLS20 uh, is and what it can become. So in case people don't know, XLS20 is a standard um, for storing NFTs on the XRP ledger. It's been implemented and deployed on test networks, including Ripple's test network, so people can play with it. The community is voting, the validators are voting to whether to adopt it on the main network. And you know, we'll see how that voting goes. I think I think it's likely to succeed at some point, but obviously I can't make any promises. I think I think it is a, a step forward for the XRP ledger. What it does is it leverages the XRP ledger's features in terms of speed, cost, and energy efficiency uh, to drive NFT utility at scale without needing layer two protocols. Um, you can't you can do NFTs on the XRP ledger right now, but it's sort of cramming a square peg in a round hole. 
like you use the existing issued asset functionality that was never designed for NFTs and it it does it does work but it's it's not great like native support will cut the costs down will cut down the amount of space it uses on the ledger you still can't store massive amounts of data on the ledger ledgers are not good for that uh, you want you want to store pointers like that's the realistic way to do it but you will get very nice features like the ability to create large numbers of XR, of of NFTs the ability to uh, to um have a owner get a residual on on subsequent sales and those kinds of features and it will be very efficient so the costs will be low and the performance will be high um the, there is the volume and we've done a lot of performance testing to have confidence that the impact won't be you know won't be significant so here's kind of where the XRP ledger would slot in once XLS20 is adopted so it would be lower cost and higher speed than most other blockchains but it wouldn't have as much functionality as blockchains like Ethereum have it would it you'll be on a blockchain that has the decks and liquidity so you'll be able to use up you know you'll be able to use liquidity on the ledger to make payments so if somebody wants to xrp for a, you know for an nft and you want to pay in some other asset that'll be very easy you'll have all the advantages of being close to the pools of liquidity that are on the xrp ledger but you won't be able to build smart contracts that do things with the nft that are not part of the fixed fun the set of functionality that the xrp ledger offers and those xrp ledger will have an nft function a function and it will have a set of features and if those features do what you want that's great and if they don't well you, you just won't get the functions that you want but there is actually a huge advantage to that limitation which is everybody will know what they get so if you have an nft on ethereum and you don't know what's in that smart contract you have no idea like can the can the nft be clawed back by the owner um can you be, can a limit be can you be limited in your ability to transfer it you know what can what what can happen to it you don't know i'm sure you've seen thefts where people didn't know that they had enabled certain functions like they placed an offer to sell something and they forgot to cancel it and like and the reason that happens is because the system is so powerful that people can create features for good but they can also create features for evil and not tell the users about them and in theory you would have to vet every smart contract that you were going to interact with on Ethereum, which is great if you can do that and you need functionality that they don't have. Because the functionality on the on the XRP ledger is predefined and, and preset, every tool that interacts with the XRP ledger knows what it takes to transfer an NFT. There can't, there can't be some secret way that someone's created to take an NFT from you that they may not have told you about that's unique to their smart contract because there aren't smart contracts. So there are actually security advantages to the simplicity of the XRP ledger's implementation. But the disadvantage, again, is if you need something the implementation doesn't provide, you can't create it yourself because that would undo the very security. That would, that would increase the cost, that would reduce the speed, that would undo the security guarantee. All of the pluses would go away if we allowed that. So it's a trade-off. And I think there will be a lot of projects that find that that's a very good trade-off. Um, the, the performance, the cost, the reliability, and the fact that it has, I mean, the feature set that was chosen for XLS20 was based on the features that people said they needed. People said they really needed a feature, unless it was like totally niche, obviously we would have included it. And if, of course, it's subject to subsequent amendment if there are people who say, hey, I really could use this little, this little feature. So that's kind of where the XRP ledger will slot in once XLS20 um, is deployed. And, you know, Ripple has been driving partnerships, Fluff World probably being the one that, that that's the most uh, well known around uh, you know around these types of XRP ledger capabilities, and we have the Creator Fund, which has you know has uh, you know a good set of um, of partnerships around that to drive you know to drive people onto the ledger. Uh, Mint NFT, Mintable, and a couple other companies have have committed to um, once that, once that XLS twenty is accepted by the by eighty percent of the validators. The, the kinds of ways in which slots slots in is very very practical, very pragmatic, which I appreciate about everything uh, in terms of you know your your and Ripple Ripple's approach. Um, what's kind of like the the vision for and and I think maybe the answer about the question to, to preempt my question is probably like well you know the developers are going to tell us right and I uh, being on the on sort of the platform side um, you know it's really like the develop it's amazing what developers and and even just individuals create on things like Minecraft Roblox or even if you know you're you're on the platform side and you just get a group of developers. So really, they, they they tell you, but um, a priori, and and obviously you have some great examples already. Um, do you have do you have sort of an idea of what kinds of things XLS twenty could unlock? Like, what's kind of your dream vision of the future of what um, you know things can be achieved that can't be achieved today uh, as developers get their hands on on, on these powerful new tools? I think it's going to be collectibles first, just because that's the easiest lift. And obviously, if that that's people, people are going to want to sort of shake the technology out and 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 make sure it works, and just make sure that the the functionality you know is is there. But I think the more interesting things are going to be things like functional NFTs. And so, like you're sort of halfway there with things in like with like game objects. 
because it, it it's more than just something that you show with other people and look at. Um, it's something that has you know some some more practical, some more you know some more direct usability. And I think I think you mentioned before like land deeds and um, and so I think that those ideas of tracking ownership of unique objects. I think things like digital rights. Um, but I have to say, it, it, I I don't I don't have a crystal ball, and I don't really know what the what the there there is. And I'll and I'll and I'll candidly tell you that I'm not a hundred. Like if we can't wait until it's obvious that this is going to be like massively successful, I think the signs are there, but I think it's early, and so I think uh, that it could succeed in ways that we don't predict, and it could turn out that there isn't much there. But I think that the the the, the there's a lot of friction in moving around ownership of things. And I think NFTs that track to things uh, is a very, very interesting area. The, the, the pitch that I give, like the simple reason for why I think the technology will work is that very often you can form a partnership with a group of people who can agree on a set of rules, but they can't agree on who will enforce the rules. And so typically what we do when that happens is like, if I agree that I'm going to, you know, I'm going to mow your lawn and you're going to pay me $50 right now because I need it and I'm going to mow your lawn tomorrow. What we usually do is the way we enforce the rules is we go to court. Um, and that's really expensive and really inefficient. And the net effect is basically court sucks so much for both of us that like we hope it doesn't happen. But if you and I are in different countries, that's not even like that may be almost you know, virtually impossible. And it may be that the effort of having to go to court actually is so bad for the person who would have to go to court that it actually advantages the person who's, who like doesn't comply with the contract. And so NFT, what NFTs can do is they can be the thing that enforces the rules. So if you and I agree on the rules, we don't have to agree on who will enforce the rules. The rules will be enforced. So this is the same pitch for smart contracts, right? Like the idea of a smart contract is you and I can agree on the terms. I'm like, I'll put up collateral and you'll make payments. And if you don't make payments, I get the collateral. But who's going to hold the collateral? And who's going to make sure, who's going to check to see if you made the payments or not? Like normally what we'd have to do is we have to go to court. But, you know, if you're if if you're in Australia and I'm in Zimbabwe, like us having to go to court to solve a problem is not it's, it's not a great it's not a great solution for either of us. And so here's where, like, you could imagine different companies that you know, different pla different places that issue land deeds, different people that issue game objects that may want to be portable between universes. Like they may be able to agree on a set of rules for the system, but they may not be able to decide who enforces it. And what they would normally do is have to form a consortium. And they would have to raise money and they would have to like have procedures to vote on rules and have conferences that people would have to go to. It's very expensive and awkward to sort of make the system work. And so this can eliminate that cost. And so I find that I find that a very plausible use case. I think I think that's going to grow. Oh, I love that. I love that. I can't wait to see how, how things develop in the coming years and um, the coming months even. Um, you know, you talked about gaming a lot and, I'm, you know, I'm a gamer. It sounds like you're a gamer based on, you know, your reference to your Steam library and the fact that you owned a video game video game store, which is so, so <laughs> fascinating. There's some sectors of cryptoverse that think gaming will be the first, um, you know, so the first real application of NFTs or the first place where it really blows up because of the fact that, you know, you have a closed system, right, where kind of everything gets controlled. I mean, it's hard to enforce, you know, smart contract in Ethereum might say you own this land contract, but if the government says you don't, then, you know, it's, it's interesting, whereas in the game world, it's all a closed loop. And of course, that brings to this topic of the metaverse. And I, I'd be curious about, to hear about your views on that, the intersection of crypto and the metaverse. And in particular, you know, back in the quaint old days of 2013 you know, or so, in the quote, early days of this phase of VR, the VR has had many different cycles. You know, it, it seemed like VR what, and the metaverse were basically kind of tied together, like a VR world would become the metaverse. Um, but I'm lucky to, I just joined this kind of, you know, metaverse council uh, with a bunch of fancy people, fancy names or whatever. Um, and we spent almost all our time talking about NFTs, uh, which was interesting to me. I was like, well, I thought VR and metaverse had a lot to do with each other, but apparently NFTs uh, sort of are, are what define a metaverse. And uh, anyway, that, that was all very interesting and there's a lot to discuss there, but I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on the intersection of crypto and the metaverse and just the metaverse in general. Well, I think, I think that um, one of the things that I've thought about Many, many, many years ago, before this whole metaverse VR thing, in fact, in the early days of the internet, back when, even when the World Wide Web was brand new and we had the very the earlier technologies, human beings have a fundamental sense of place, of being somewhere, and of things being near us and relative position. Like that's how you know we 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 evolved as hunters. And when you're a hunter, like where are you? Where's the prey? Is the prey a threat? What what where are the places that you can hide? Where's the prey going to go? Where are you going to go? 
These are things that are very core to the way we view the world. And in the early days of the internet, there was a question of like, should we just let people jump from place to place? And this is, this happens in games too. Like many games have a teleport mechanic because the world is large and it would be very tedious, but they don't always let you teleport from random place to random place because then there would be no sense of play. Like they don't just put everything in the same place because then there would you would be completely, you're like, I'm over in this part of the world. And over in this region, there's this area where there's this dungeon or, or spaceport or whatever. Like notions of place are, are very important to orienting us. The military, when they were building jets, what they were thinking about was what they were thinking about is like, I want the pilot to be feeling like he's hunting. I want him to feel yeah. like he's in a jungle and he's stalking prey. And like, because we're 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 good at that and we like doing it. Like it's it's <laughs> it's what we're meant for to some extent like that we're meant for anything. And I think that what the metaverse is trying to do is 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 to some extent like use those types of metaphors and those types of ways of thinking and putting us in an in a world that has the things that we want in virtual you know the things that we want in from from the internet but presents them in a way that's much more visceral that's much more engaging that's much more entertaining um and it's just it's just more interesting and if you think about you know games use the use the metaphor of place Whereas, you know, websites sort of do. And, you know, there was this there was this thing of like, you know, do you do you make the thing to delete a file, a trash can? Like, yeah, people see a trash can. They know what it means. In theory, it could be any you know, it could be anything. But we do that because that connects to people and they instantly understand it. And that type of sort of instant graphs. For me, the metaverse is about restoring that aspect of reality into um into the into the virtual worlds that we go into whether it could be the world wide web it could be a game it could be it could be some something that i'm studying some interesting subject and restoring the metaphors of place and position and time and sight things like sight lines like i can go over there to see this thing or i can go over there to see this thing and so everything isn't at me at once I think it's kind of it's kind of that and i think it's an it, it's sort of an open question of how engaging and interesting that will be i think AR and VR for games, I think, are pretty well proven. The big question is, like, can people create games that can compete? Because we've been doing, we've been creating, it's the same thing with 3D movies. Like, if you ever saw a really great 3D movie, it's an incredible experience. But the movie has to be, like, almost written for, I don't know if you saw the movie Gravity, but I saw Gravity in 3D, and it was fantastic. It was a fant I was like, whoa, like, that. that's how, you know, every other 3D movie is like, I found this in the in the mall. You know, it's like, whoa, that's wait, but why is he like shoving his keys at you? Right, like, or or something will blow up and there'll be droplets all throughout the theater. You're like, wow, that's really cool. But like, I don't want to wow. That's really cool. I want the whole experience to be engaging. And so the question is going to be, can we build entire experiences that are engaging at the quality level? Um, and I've and I've seen like I, like I saw a demo of, of what Fluff World was building um, when I was in New York, and I was like, yeah, that's. But but it's it's dangerous to say that because what can happen is you you can get you can get tricked by something that looks really cool for a few seconds. Like if I showed you with a, you know a twenty second excerpt of a three D movie that was really fantastic, you'd be like, oh that's how many people have seen a trailer for a movie and like wow that looks like a great movie. You go see the movie like oh, I saw all the good bits in the trailer. It's it remains to be seen whether they can build something that's enduring, that's entertaining over long or edu whatever they're going for. They're going for entertainment. Are they going for educational? Are they, you know what are they going for? Relaxing? Can they can they build things that will endure? And and I'm very encouraged by like the sort of things that I've seen samples of, but it remains to be seen whether they'll be able to compete. With, you know where are the three D movies that compete with two D movies? Like they just haven't. No one's been able to really pull that off, even though there are some exceptional bits. And I think. I think it could it it could be that the that that if they can tap into those sort of fundamental human experiences that we want to have about place and time and position and and those things, I think they could be wildly successful. But I don't know. Mm -hmm. We'll we'll see. I'm I'm ex I'm, we'll I'm see. enthusiastically optimistic, but always a little bit cynical. Yeah, and and there's reason to be just because there's been so many ups and downs with this industry. But to your point, I think long term engagement really is the 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 key to creating metaverse experiences. And what's interesting is there are niche groups of people that that are growing that are spending more and more time in in VR, right? Like you know, not just one, two, three hour sessions, but four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve hours just for entertainment. And the question is, how is that niche a sign of something to come like, you know, like the, you know, the, the, the power PayPal users that became, you know, that, that, that was sort of the growth vector, or is it really just going to be stick to that niche? I think that's going to be the question for the next uh, few years, uh, which I'll be excited well, I, to see. I got a data point for you. So I tried out VR at my sister's house and I immediately ordered a full set of equipment for me. 
I've used it like twice since then. That was years ago. However, my grandson, he uses VR for everything. He watches YouTube videos in VR. I don't know why, but he does. He uses Google Earth in VR for every, like he, so maybe that's the, maybe you have to grow up in it or maybe I'm not, maybe I'm too old, maybe I'm too old to get it. Uh, but definitely though, there are people who find those experiences extremely compelling and that's, that's what they're, that's what they're, that's what they're drawn to. They, you know, so maybe I'm just not that person. Maybe the technology hasn't reached, maybe I think part of it might be, I'm so good at what I do that like, I'm so used to the environment I'm in that like, if you want to put me into a new environment, it's going to have to be so much better for me to like, learn how to do it. Whereas he, you know, he was dropped in that environment. And so he's just super comfortable in it, but he does everything in VR. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm definitely somebody who is a VR believer, but, and I wonder how much of what I do uh, translates, but from a purely practical perspective, you know, when my wife and I were getting married, we use Google earth to look at wedding venues and actually saved a lot of trips. Like, Oh, we don't need to go to big Sur anymore because we saw the place and, you know, it's got a parking lot right next to it, but the Google, you know, photos on, on Google maps show just like these beautiful things. So, you know, it really, it really does help. I mean, they're, they're really just very practical applications, but I think for entertainment, um, every time I jump, I take a hiatus and jump back into VR, I'm amazed at how much, you know, the ecosystem has grown. Um, so, you know, when I do it just for fun, so that's really heartening to see. So I, I'd be curious to see how much that scales, you know, just, just kind of a few things. I mean, we talked a little about Columbia land deeds. I mean, that that's breaking news and I'd love to hear perspective on that. Cause that's, that's just huge uh, to me. And I'd love to hear about anything that maybe wasn't covered publicly. No secret insights, uh, really. But I do think, I think that that idea of tracking the ownership of, of physical goods or, you know, real property um, is something that like one of the problems that you have is the concern that there might be something that you don't know where it is. Like there might be some competing claim that's in some other ledger or in some other record that's, um, you know, that's, that's on something else. And so I think having an authoritative you know, electronic database that tracks that ownership solves a, a very real problem. I think also the cost of transfer is just very high. You know, like if you've ever bought or sold real estate, you know that it's it's just very, very complicated. The challenge there, of course, is you do need some level of regulatory buy-in for that to work. And so that's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see whether, are there entrenched big interests in the transfer of real estate? They're going to like try to push back against this. I mean, you know, will attorney lobbies push back and say, hey, people are going to get their land stolen because their computer was hacked and like there needs to be regulatory hook ins like it has to, you know, has to take a court order, which might make, you know, obviously, if the if the government in the area where the land is doesn't accept whoever claims to be the owner, then, you know, you this is actually one of the first things that the XRP ledger did that I think was very interesting at the time. The XRP ledger has issued assets that are controlled by a counterparty. So you can have a you can have a dollar that somebody owes you, and it's a it's an actual legal obligation tracked on the ledger. And if I transfer that to you, then you become like the sort of legal beneficiary, and that has to have a way to respond to a court order. Because if a court says that I don't owe you the money, then the ledger is wrong, right? If the ledger says that a piece that you own a piece of property, and a court says I do, the ledger is wrong. And so it's an interesting it's an interesting application where the ledger is being used in a subtly different way. It's it's. It's the almost authoritative record, essentially. Like, like the Bitcoin blockchain is the authoritative record of who holds what Bitcoin. Here it's the here it's the almost authoritative record. And so it can reduce a lot of friction and cost and a lot of complexity involved in searching and finding. But it is, you know, it is always subject to that sort of but I, th but I think that I think it can remove enough of the friction that it's still a viable use. Because usually the idea is, well, if it's not authoritative, what's the point? I think there is a big point in being able to track actual legal obligations on a public blockchain, so yeah. long as the blockchain can be kept accurate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love that thinking, and that's that's partly what I think a lot about. Because you know, if you build it into a game, for example, closed loop, then it is the authoritative. You know, you own this in the right. game. But you know, with the real world, they're, they're, that interface is, is always tricky. Um, speaking of regulatory, um, you know, hmm. you know, last week there was interesting things with Coinbase and, of course, the SEC and, you know, nine cryptocurrencies deemed securities and seven of them trade on uh, Coinbase and Coinbase, of course, absolutely saying that they're not securities in response, which I thought it was a great blog post. Uh, any commentary on that? I mean, I know, I know, you know, you have your own experiences with regulatory bodies, but anything yeah. about recent news? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so it, it, if you look at the problem with like bad government. It's usually not bad rules. It's when you don't know what the rules are or you don't know how the, or effectively you don't know how they're going to be enforced, which is the same thing. Like if you look at dictatorships, like when they, 
when they put some, but when they put an activist in jail, they don't say, oh, he was an activist who disagreed with the government, so he put him in jail. They say he was corrupt, he took a bribe, we have this evidence, right? It's not that the rules are bad. The rules, like if you're corrupt and take a bribe, you should go to jail. I think most people would agree with that. That's a reasonable rule. What happens is the enforcement is so unpredictable that this sort of hammer comes down on you. And, you know, I speak to people who are trying to decide where to build. And there are certainly countries that other countries that have bad laws and there are bad laws in the United States. And they're like, well, can we work around them? Or do we have to pick another jurisdiction? Maybe we do. And that's fine. Or maybe, you know, there are some, some countries that basically just made very restrictive laws on digital assets. It's like, we don't understand this and it might be being used to finance terrorists. So we're just going to prohibit it. And at least everybody knows what the rules are. The problem in the United States is that you could be talking to regulators for years and years and completely transparent and all of a sudden they can turn around and say like you should have known that you were breaking the law for you know all these number of years i can't think of any company that's worked with the sec more closely than coinbase in this space coinbase like they went public right and and they, they had to like, you can't do that without the sec's blessing right and and what's interesting about the coinbase case for me is you know people have been complaining about regulation by enforcement but this case is is extraordinary because Essentially, what they're doing is they're accusing Coinbase of breaking the law because Coinbase is not can't, it doesn't have the regulatory that can't meet the regulatory requirements for exchanging a security. But they're not charging Coinbase with anything. They're not giving Coinbase any opportunity to defend themselves. They can't do what Ripple did, where they can go through discovery and they can you know they can file a response and they, a judge is going to hear it and decide you know does the does the SEC have a case and you know they can get discovery and they can't do any of those things because the case is not against them. And this is almost unprecedented. Governments can investigate people for wrongdoing and should. And if they think that, you know, let's say the government thinks you did something wrong, they might ask you about it. They might say, hey, Eugene, we saw this, this, and this, like what's going on? And you might answer them or you might not. And then they, they, they'll they decide, like, are they going to file charges against you? And they might file charges against you. And that's when it becomes public. It becomes public when they be, file charges against you, or unless you make it public earlier. And then you have an opportunity to respond. And they have to say, this is the law you broke, and here's the evidence. This is what we like. And then you can file a response. It is It is extremely out of the normal range for a regulator to essentially accuse a company of wrongdoing in a lawsuit that does not involve that company at all. And like these... The people who are accused of insider trading are not going to want to fight, you know, something like the Ripple lawsuit. You know, Ripple is f- fighting over the status of XRP. Imagine having to fight, what, eight or nine versions of that when it doesn't even matter to you because they're facing substantially the same charges as wire fraud. So this, this, this is just, I, I don't know what to do, but just to, to scratch my head and throw my, 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 my hands up. I mean, it's just... It's just, it's just, it's, it's, it's frustrating to me. And and the, the thing that annoys me the most about the lawsuit, you know, honestly, is that it is effectively acts like a gag. Like there's so much more I would like to say that I can't because, you know, I'd like to talk about the issues in our case. I mean, there are things that I, I did talk about, like on, but sometimes like before the case, before the case, and now I can't. And so that's just like, I'd like to weigh in on my opinion of like, of like the type of arguments they're making. And I can't do that. And it's just, it's, it's frustrating to me, very frustrating. You know, as, as an American, as a fellow American, it really, um, what, what hurts me is it, from looking at it from the outside is centers of innovation, companies like Ripple and Coinbase, which should be the darlings of our crypto industry in the US, you know, are, are encountering these issues. I'm curious, have thoughts on what other countries are going to gain because of this? Is it going to be Singapore? Is it going to be Switzerland? I mean, you know, Binance kind of decided not to go to Singapore as an example, but what countries are Going to be the most friendly to crypto going forward is it going to be malta i mean i'm curious where where do you foresee you know gaining where gaining where the us loses yeah much of asia and um smaller european countries that are just really hungry for innovation it's it is for me as an american too it is it is extremely frustrating you know i i imagine this counterfactual where in the early days of the internet the united states government was like this is being used to buy child pornography and spread child pornography and finance terrorism and steal state secrets and hack into you know power systems and so we should just prohibit the internet in the United States can you imagine like there would still be a Google and an Apple and and a Microsoft and th- these wouldn't be US companies i mean we would have faced a take it or leave it choice with the internet can you imagine if you know the internet was built by countries that built identity into every packet I mean, what a different world we would live in. And that's what we're doing with cryptocurrency. We're pushing the innovation to other countries. And those countries, those regulators have a seat at the table. And it, it's just, yeah, it just as an, as an American, as someone who wants to see, as someone who, you know, I put roots, we, we could have built Ripple in another country. 
you know, but we're Americans. And and you look at FTX and Binance, which are thriving, and Coinbase is now, I mean, is severely hobbled. I mean, and the mistake they made was they they worked with regulators and they picked the U.S. Right. That's. It's really unfortunate. Um, well, I think, you know, despite despite those, uh, despite ending on that potentially grim note, I will have to say, I think the entire crypto industry, uh, and certainly I, uh, and many others are are cheering you on and cheering Coinbase and just overall, just like I said, just the amazing work you guys have done. I mean, you really are, you really are the OG innovators and it's amazing to see Ripple innovate, you know, every single year. I mean, every year there's just so much more happening, right? Uh, it's certainly not resting on your laurels and I cannot wait to see the things that you personally, as well as, um, you know, Ripple overall, uh, continue to build to help in this, uh, this industry grow uh, and for it to flourish. So thank you so much for spending the time. Thanks. It was a pleasure talking to you. And, you know, that ending is not written yet. You know, if regulators step in mm -hmm. and so all that we're fighting over is the past, then that's, you know, that's going to be a much better place for innovation in the United States. So fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. We'll all Great be hoping for that. You. Yeah. Good talking to you. Thank you so much, David. Appreciate it. Bye, Eugene. Yeah, take care.